Welcome. My name is Heather Murray Elkins, and I am inviting you to share a time of holy stuff, holy human stuff, the materiality of a world that God loves so much. Karl Barth said we were to start every day and every sermon with the news in one hand and the gospel, uh, the scripture in another. So I began this day with this reflection. The news is not good. If we look to a land that was called historically the land of morning calm, the news is anything but calm. From North and South Korea comes the sound of war and the rumors of war. It is the one war that has in over 50 years never reached a time of peace. So it would be important in the midst of the sounds of war to look for that sense of peace. And I have a peace that could be offered. And I found this when I went to visit the studio of a very powerful uh, artist of both word and world, Changon Kim. His studio is in the northern part of South Korea. It's very close to the DMZ. And in this beautiful, lonely place, which is surrounded by magnificent mountains, he has crafted an art that comes straight out of the heart of these mountains. Both North and South Korea are a rocky peninsula, and they're ancient stones, ancient mountains that date to the pre-Cambrian era. So these stones are at the heart of both nations. And in his studio, he has taken massive stones, as big as mountains themselves, and from those stones crafted testimonies to the human holy interaction that is possible when there is peace. Uh, they, uh, they are teaching me yeah. Uh -huh. Is that a veil? So he got he, he, he got such an impression and inspiration from the natural stones. Stones are have been formulated by the force of nature and by mm -hmm. the movement of nature. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is, uh, it has been formed by mm -hmm. the wind. Sure. Or sometimes sure. by the waves of water. Yeah. Yeah. Him, by a certain work of uh, movement. Yeah. Such a formation of a nature draws me into that world. In addition to these mountain-sized sculptures that were around in his studio, I looked at the ground and the ground was covered and it sparkled. It was covered with the pieces of the stones that had been removed in order to reveal what he wanted us to see. And it was like looking at a sea of stone that sparkled, that just sparkled in the sun. And I remember picking up a piece by a sculptor I will speak of in a moment and asking him how he knew what to remove. How did he know what the stone, the mountain, wanted to be? And he said, he listens. I listen, he said. And in that hearing of the voice of the Creator comes then that tangible expression of the goodness of this world and the goodness of the Creator. So I want to take you through this stone to a particular sculpture that stood in the yard. It was not finished. It was probably 12 feet high, made out of this native Korean granite. And it was of two figures. 
one standing, one kneeling, arms wrapped around each other. There were no features yet, and the outline of the bodies was still rough, but you could see what it was. I did not need to ask. It was a homecoming. It was a welcome. It was the joy of one who has been separated being reunited there in that stony studio. There was a vision of what we can hope for. It is a vision of what we might long for. Because if you remember in that story that Jesus told, once there was a man who had two sons. We can hear some of that painful dislocation between two nations that share a common blood, that share a common language, that share an identity of what it meant to be the people of this particular place, of these mountains. And the hope for the reunion one longs for is not actually found in the gospel. If I direct you to that story, you realize it ends when the older brother comes back and is angry that this prodigal that went away, that went into a far wild country, comes back and is welcomed as if it was forgiven, as it was. The elder brother holds a grudge. And Jesus leaves that story exactly where it is. I can remember long ago, my first church, I asked in a Bible study, what would happen if that father died that night that the younger brother returned? And an old farmer said, well, the older boy will either kill his brother or run him off. The sharpness of that answer, that sound of war between brothers, was so deep, so real, it has continued to echo. So the question is, how do we end that parable so it is not that way where one brother seeks to drive another into death or exile again. How might that end differently in a place called North and South Korea? One hope is found in this unfinished sculpture. There are no names. This might be a reunion of the brothers. This might be one who had gone to a far country coming home. This might be one who believed they were in the right, realizing that they needed to welcome the other and kneel in recognition. Whatever that unfinished work is, it offers me hope in this time when we have such stony hearts. Because ultimately, the one who tells us this story about brothers is the one who is the rock of ages. The one who tells us this story is, as the psalmist says, this is the cornerstone. And so I read from the ancient song, the psalm, Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and this is the Lord's doing. So, between the gospel and the news, I want to place a reminder of Christ who is our cornerstone and the hope 
that in the end there will be a homecoming for both brothers and all creation. And this will be the Lord's doing.